thank you so much for um, joining me this afternoon and um, just taking time out of your day. I'll try and keep this to about 30 minutes or so um, so you guys can get rolling. Um, but today we're talk talking about um, are you eating too little, why metabolic slowdown happens, and how to fix it. And that this is something that's really important, especially with, um, you know, the, the narrative that if you just eat less and exercise more, you know, you'll be in a caloric deficit and you'll lose weight. But when that happens, there's a lot of things that happen um, inside the body. So we want to look at why just eating less and moving more isn't always the answer. So um, for those of you who guys don't know me, uh, my name is Megan Paval, and I am the director of nutrition at Full Strength Nutrition. And um, we are uh, throughout the talk. If you guys have any questions, um, you guys can go ahead and put those in the chat, and I will answer those either as we're going or at the end. So let's see. Okay, um, I want to explain to you guys a little bit about Whole Street Nutrition before we get started. And we believe that something as fundamental as nutrition should not be complicated. So we have a lot of people that come to us that feel really confused um, just because there's so many different diets out there and people just don't know like what is right for me, right? Um, so what it really boils down to though is accountability and support. And, you know, we can do everything that we want to see results, but it really comes down to what action are we doing consistently and what are we following through on? So uh, we focus at Whole Strength Nutrition, we focus on a habit-based approach to, um, to really focus on the individual. And we you know, utilize coaching and accountability and support um, for the long run to really help people consistently see really amazing results. Okay, so um, first question I wanna delve into is can crash dieting cause metabolic damage? Um, so you might be in one of these scenarios. Um, the first one is, you know, despite you working out consistently and with a lot of intensity, um, plus, you know, you might be eating really carefully, you might find that you're just not losing weight or you're not losing it as fast as you would like to. Or maybe you were losing weight really consistently until recently. And, you know, now maybe you're stuck, even though you feel like, man, I'm just working as hard as ever. Or maybe when you were younger, you were really fit. Maybe you did fitness competitions or maybe you did some crash diets. Um, but now when you put in the same effort, you just can't seem to get quite as lean. I know that can be really frustrating. Um, so again, we're going to talk through, okay, why is this happening? Um, so, you know, people will ask, is my metabolism damaged? Um, and the good news is um, that no, it's, it's not. Um, there are some things that will cause it to slow down and we'll delve into that in just a second. Um, but overall, um, we can reverse that slowdown. So um, next we're going to look at what um, actually makes up your metabolism. So total daily energy expenditure, um, which is on the side of this graph here, um, that is the amount of calories that you burn throughout the entire day, right? And it's made up of something called um, RMR or BMR, we say at the gym, um, um, basal metabolic rate. And that's really just the amount of calories that you burn if you were like sleeping or in a coma all day or just not moving at all. So that's really the, the, the um, calories that your body burns to just have or do its daily um, functions. Um, so it's made up of your BMR, it's made up of um, the, the thermic effect of food, which is the amount of calories that your body um, needs to actually digest the food that you're eating. Um, it's made up of your NEAT. So the activity that you're doing throughout your day, NEAT stands for non-activity, um, excuse me, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So um, that's, you know, things like um, fidgeting um, at your day job. Um, if you're, you know, sitting or standing, um, you know, just walking around, getting to your car, things like that. Um, and then it's also um, the, the last piece of the total daily energy expenditure is your eat or your exercise activity thermogenesis. So um, when, we, when we look at the, where it says RMR or BMR, so there are a lot of factors that go into that. So your age um, will, you know, the older that you get, your metabolism will slow down a little bit. Um, your sex matters. Um, men tend to burn more than females because they have more muscle mass. Um, your growth stage matters. So, you know, obviously when you're younger, your metabolism is a lot higher. Um, the amount of lean body mass that you have will, will, will um, highly contribute to your BMR. So um, this is actually one thing that you can control. Um, your hormones um, have an impact on that. Your genetics do. Your stress 
does as well. So that's something else you can control. And then pregnancy um, and temperature will contribute to that as well. So there's a couple of things you can play with. The biggest one being your stress levels, um, really learning to manage stress um, and then working to put on lean muscle mass, which we'll talk about that later. Um, and then with the thermic effect of food. So this is really interesting um, because there's two things that make up the um, the amount of calories that your body needs to digest food. The first one is macro composition. And so when we're talking about macros, we're talking about carbs, fat, and protein. And um, protein actually is the most thermic of all the macros. So it requires, it requires the most amount of calories to actually digest. Um, that can get up to um, as high as 20% of, like say you have a chicken breast, then about 25% of the calories from that chicken breast will just go to digesting that chicken breast. Um, carbs will hang out around between 10, maybe 20%, probably closer to 15%. And that really depends on how complex or how simple those carbohydrates are. So if you're having, you know, simple carbs where um, it's not a lot of fiber and they just, they're really fast digesting, they're easy for the body to process, that's going to be closer to about 10% to about of those calories. Um, we'll go towards um, the thermic effect, or, um, if you're having more complex carbs, um, you know, things like brown rice and sweet potatoes that will go higher to like 15 to 20%. And then your fat, um, that takes anywhere from like zero to like 5%. That's very easy, um, for your body not to have to do a whole lot with to digest it. So it takes a while, but, um, but there's not a whole lot of energy expenditure there. So, so, um, we want to make sure that we're eating enough, um, protein and that will come to about, um, 30% of your calories from your entire day, you want to be a protein source. And that really will up, that can really change if you're, um, you know, digesting away from like 10 to then 25% of your, um, your food, you can actually determine how many, um, more calories your body will expend. So, um, in the Western diet here, we, we typically will, um, burn about 10%, but, you know, obviously we can change it if we're not eating like a typical American. And, um, and this is what's interesting too. Some people will say that, wow, I'm eating way more food than I used to, but they've changed the composition of their food. And so they notice that, Hey, even though I'm eating more, their body, their, their um, metabolism has raised to digest it. So that's why they see like, I'm eating more, but I'm actually losing weight. Um, and then that kind of leads then into the processing of the food. So obviously you know, the more processed the food is, the more, or the easier it is for your body to not have to process that food. Right. So if you, um, you know, if you leave the, the, um, uh, fiber and, and you leave just like the whole food intact, um, you know, it's going to take more for your body to break down that food versus if it's in that process state already, again, all the work's been done for the body. So that's why too, I've had some people ask, you know, if I'm eating, you know, 1400 calories, why does it matter if it comes from candy bars or if it comes from whole foods? And this is why that matters, that thermic effect of food. Um, and then last couple of things. So your neat, um, so that is, that's super important. Your knee will actually have a bigger effect on your, on your metabolism than the exercise that you do. So I'll kind of skip up here. So exercise, um, that's determined. The amount of calories is determined by the intensity, the duration, what you're doing, like say you're weightlifting or you're running and then your body mass. So, um, the, the, um, the exercise component is going to account for about 5% of your overall, um, metabolism. And so I like to tell people, remember when you work out, it's to, it's to actually get strong and get fit. You're not trying to, you know, make room for food that you get later that day, or you're not trying to like burn off food that you already ate. Um, you really want to use the time in the kitchen and the rest of, you know, maybe the other 15 hours of your day to move around and stay active and then use that time to actually get lean. Don't try and use the time at the gym to get lean. Um, and I, you know, I have a lot of people, and I used to think this too, a lot of people are like, well, I already, I worked out for the day. So if I sit at my desk the entire day, it's fine. Cause I'm, I'm going to do CrossFit later. I'm going to, you know, go for a run later. And, um, and that's, again, that's really not the case. It's like, you can, you can use so much more of your day to really leverage, um, getting lean. So you're neat. Well, exercise will account for about 5%. The, the neat component, the other activity that you, that you do throughout the day will com, 
um, will contribute about 15% of your metabol um, metabolism. So it's really important to stay moving, go for walks when you can, stand um, at your, if you have a desk job, stand instead of sitting. And this is really interesting. So kind of more on meat. Um, what you do for work is going to have a really big impact on um, how many calories you're burning um, each day. So there was a study done and, and it took an eight hour work day um, and it looked at individuals who were chair bound for the entire day and they found that on average they burned about 280 calories over those eight hours. Um, those who were seated but had the ability to stand and move around um, burned about 650 calories. And then those who stood the entire day burned about 860 calories, which is about four times, excuse me, four times more than those who were just sitting all day. Um, and then those that had a strenuous job, um, they actually burned up just, um, just doing their job to about, um, just under 2,300 calories, which is incredible. So, um, so again, that's, that's can be so important for just remembering, okay, can I get up and move? Have I been sitting for an hour? Get up and move um, and do what you can. Um, and then let's see. Okay, so, um, you know, so with that information that we just learned about the metabolism, what do we actually do with this information? And we wanna, again, like I said, we, we wanna focus on a habit-based approach and we wanna focus on one thing at a time. So really it boils down to eat a high protein, high fiber, minimally processed diet and take the stairs. And it's a really simple approach. It's not easy, but it's really simple. And so maybe you look at one of those things for right now. Maybe you say, um, you know, with, with the protein, maybe you know that, Hey, I'm not getting in enough protein at each meal. And we'll talk about what that can look like at the end of this lecture. Um, but maybe it's like, you know, Hey, I'm going to make sure to eat a protein dense food at every single meal and snack and you work on that. And once that becomes normal, then you can focus on, okay, now I'm gonna focus on my fiber intake and, and really focus on getting um, you know, low sugar, high fiber um, fruits and lots of vegetables and whole grains and things like that. Um, and then, you know, or maybe it's like, hey, I feel like my nutrition's pretty good, but I really wanna focus on making sure that I get a walk-in first thing in the morning at my lunch break after dinner, um, or I wanna stand more. So. So make it simple, focus on that one thing and that will start to yield um, good results. So um, next we'll move on to metabolic slowdown. And um, when you are in a caloric deficit, your metabolism will slow down as you lose weight. And that's because you become a smaller individual and smaller individuals burn less calories than larger individuals, right? Just because, um, you know, mass, mass just burns more calories. So, and tend, and you tend to have a little bit more muscle mass too, when you're, um, just a larger individual. So, um, when we talk about metabolic slowdown, that really is a catch all term for anything that causes a decrease in your metabolism during a, a caloric deficit. So there's a lot of factors that will, well, that will, um, contribute to that. So first one is decreased BMR. So again, um, talking about, you know, you, tend to have lean, um, muscle mass and, um, and then, uh, your, you know, stress will contribute to that too. And hormones, um, your thermic effect of food will decrease probably because you are eating less food overall. So that will change. Um, sometimes the, um, your exercise activity thermogenesis that will decrease, um, because again, less body mass will burn less calories. And then a lot of times our meat, actually, most of the time, our meat is going to decrease as well. And that's because your body, it doesn't, it doesn't realize that, you know, just for a short amount of time that you're going to be in a deficit. It, it thinks all of a sudden like, oh crap, I'm not going to get as many calories. I need to reserve and I, I need you to stop moving so much. So we don't need to burn as many calories. So really subconsciously you'll, you'll find that you're sitting a lot more, you know, you're not maybe, um, you know, you're not fidgeting throughout your day. You're just a lot more still. And so a way to overcome that will be to be really intentional about getting movement in. Um, you know, when I, especially when I'm in a deficit, I like to make sure I'm getting an extra, you know, rowing session in, or I'm going for more walks, or I'm just being really intentional about, hey, I'm still gonna keep moving, even though my body's subconsciously trying to tell me to not. Um, and then I, something called adaptive thermogenesis occurs, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. 
Um, but this is all, it's a completely normal thing. It's frustrating, but it's normal. Um, and it does make weight loss a little bit harder, but it's overall, it, it's really not a problem. So we'll talk through adaptive thermogenesis next. Um, and the definition for that, it really is just, it's a decrease in the number of calories your body burns each day beyond what would be predicted to occur from changes in your basal metabolic rate, the thermic effect of food, um, eat and then meet all the things that make up your metabolism. So this happens because you're, again, your body doesn't understand that just for its health, like at some point you're going to willingly end your deficit. Um, and, you know, our body will tend to view all of this change as, um, potentially being in danger of starving to death. So, <laughs> so again, that's why we want to do what we can eat more, um, protein, more fiber, get more movement in to help with this. Um, okay, so next slide is um, how to re reduce the impact of adaptive thermogenesis. And we want to avoid um, too big of a caloric deficit. 20% um, is a really good goal to hit. Um, a lot of diets, especially if they're more extreme or kind of crash diets, will have you at like 30 or more percent. And that's just really not a great strategy because um, you're gonna you're more prone to lose muscle mass that way. And it, obviously it's not sustainable. So you're probably going to really restrict and then binge and just kind of be on that cycle. Um, so doing being at a 20% deficit is enough to see results, but it's enough to have sustainable um, outcomes. And then um, minimizing stress, that is so huge. Being in a caloric deficit is a stressor to your body. And so, you know, if you're in a really stressful season, maybe with your job or, um, you know, relationship or whatever, if you just know that I've got a lot of stress going on, that's probably not a great time to, um, to be in a deficit. It's probably more of a time to, to, um, eat at maintenance. And again, really trying to up your quality of food, but try and minimize stress with, um, with breathing, with, um, you know, going for walks with lots, there's lots of different ways to do that, but making that a priority instead of being a deficit is probably a good idea. Um, you also want to avoid dropping carbs too low. Um, carbs have a massive impact on leptin, um, which is a hormone that's responsible or directly correlated for adaptive thermogenesis. So all that to say is ones that will have you at, especially like sub hundred grams, every, you know, each day, that's, it's just overall for hormone sake, that's just not a great, um, place to be. And then um, there's something called refeeds and diet breaks um, that you can utilize as well. And that's really just having time to eat at maintenance. Um, if you have a refeed day, like for some of my athletes, I'll have them, um, you know, be in a deficit for, um, you know, say five or six days a week. And then there, there'll be one day where I'll have them eat at maintenance to um, a, just help with, um, help them feel like, okay, this is sustainable. Like I don't have to wait, you know, four months or whatever to finally have this treat or, or something that can build that in. Um, it's a good break psychologically. And it also, again, it just gives your body a break to say, Hey, I'm going to give you enough, eat at maintenance, and then we'll go back to being consistent, um, the rest of the week. Um, and then the other way to reduce the impact of adaptive thermogenesis is to actually just get out of a caloric deficit. And this is the other thing too. A lot of times we'll see that people will just be in a perpetual deficit because they're always trying to lose weight. Um, and eventually their metabolism will just slow down to where they're no longer in a deficit. Um, and so this just actually getting out and being in maintenance for a while um, is really the way to go from there. Okay, so summary so far. So metabolic slowdown is real. Um, progress happens at a slower rate, which will then require more adjustments to your caloric intake to maintain progress. So, you know, um, if you, you know, whatever changes you make initially as your body adapts, you'll probably have to keep making more changes, um, you know, to keep seeing those results. Um, metabolic slowdown is not responsible for your inability to continue seeing progress and results. Um, so I don't want you guys to think like, well, it's, it's too slow. There's no point. Like we can definitely work around that, but that is a factor. Um, adapt, adaptive thermogenesis is real, is a real thing. And then um, it, it definitely can't be avoided, but there are ways to reduce it. Like we just talked about in that previous slide. Um, okay, so starvation mode. Um, that is kind of a, a buzzword. And, um, and I, th this is good news. You cannot be in a caloric deficit and not lose 
weight or body mass, right? The scale may temporarily stop moving, but overall, if you are not losing weight anymore, you're not in a deficit anymore. Um, and so starvation mode is kind of the idea that it's like, oh, you know, I'm eating at such a deficit. My body just wants to hold on to everything. And, and I, therefore I can't lose weight, but, um, you know, and again, while slowdown does happen, like this whole starvation mode thing, it's, it's not real. It doesn't actually happen. So this does not mean that you should drop calories to a really low level to, to continue seeing weight loss. If, if after a while, again, you stop seeing results or things, you know, you're, you're, you just notice that, okay, I'm kind of plateauing, then it's probably time to get out of that deficit, eat at maintenance for a while, let your metabolism come back up again. And then you actually have something to pull from. Um, next question is, is metabolic damage real? I've heard this time and time again, from people like, ah, oh, I just damaged it from, you know, all the stuff I used to do when I was younger. Um, but the good news is, is that it's not actually a real thing. So, um, even in cases when somebody has reached a really low, um, percentage of body fat, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's like a bodybuilder, you know, who's going on stage and they're at like their minimum, like for survival, <laughs> um, body fat percentage, um, or, you know, I mean, people will look at, okay, people in concentration camps, like they got super low. Um, there's actually, there's still no sign that some sort of permanent damage induced metabolic slowdown, like just stays and stays with you, you know, afterwards, like you can, you can get out of that. Um, there was a meta-analysis um, looking at um, something called the Minnesota starvation experiment. This was an experiment done, I think it was like the forties. Um, um, and this was done on um, anorexics and they actually like put people, they like starved them for the study. Um, and they found that there was no permanent damage after they let everybody eat at maintenance again. So even for those, like there was one guy, he like literally chewed his finger off to get out of the study. Um, they got to such a, a low body fat. Um, but after about three months of eating at maintenance level, their metabolisms, metabolisms were restored. So that stinks that they went through that, but I'm really glad to have that information now to know that, Hey, okay, we can, we can reverse this. Um, and also similar conclusions were reached when looking at yo-yo dieters. So people that have just been, you know, up and down dieting, non-dieting, you know, for years, um, similar, similar conclusions have happened. So again, it can be reversed. It's not permanent damage. Okay. So we're going to go through, um, about five or six steps to, to learn how to generate long-term results. So step one is to, um, strength train for hypertrophy. And, um, this will include increase your resting metabolic rate, right? Cause you're putting on more lean muscle mass. Um, it also will burn calories during exercise and after that's the great thing about strength training and high intensity, um, training is that it continues to burn hours and hours after you're done working out. So, um, so that's huge to, um, and, and I, when I say hypertrophy, I mean, anywhere from like the eight to 12 rep range. Um, for exercises. So, um, so you're not going for total like muscular endurance, not where it's like 12 to 25 reps, but also not super, you know, for strength where it's like around five reps. Um, so strength training also seems to increase your neat or like your activity throughout the day as well. Um, and then also creating new muscle is an energetically demanding process. Your body's going to need more calories to build more muscle. So that will help generate, you know, actually having long-term, um, good, just healthy results. Okay. So step two, um, is then to optimize protein intake. So, um, again, we talked about this protein is the most thermic of all the macros. Um, again, you can burn about 25%, um, uh, when you went to digest protein versus the, um, anywhere from like zero to 15% for carbs and fats. Um, you want to aim for about 0.8 grams to one gram per pound of body weight every single day. So, um, I like to tell people, okay, unless you have a lot of weight to lose and you, and you have like a certain target goal that you're trying to hit, you want to take your body weight, you know, say it's 175 pounds. You want to eat about 175 grams of protein every day. And you also want to distribute it, um, to where you're getting at least 20 to 25 grams in a sitting. So your body has a threshold for how much protein it can, um, handle at a time. And so you don't want to go like, I would say like 
40 to 50 grams, probably 50 or so is like the, the threshold there. Um, but if you're eating below 20 to 25 grams, you're actually not even like hitting that good threshold. So your body could utilize more and you're just not giving it enough. So you don't, you know, sometimes people will, will be like, Oh, I, you know, it's the end of the day, I have to make it my protein and try to eat 80 grams. And it's like, okay, well at that point you're just wasting protein. So try and get in set sittings of at least 20, 25 grams at a time. Um, and four or more servings. So I like to tell people, especially when they're starting out, you know, Hey, is it doable for you to get in, you know, protein at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and your snacks, let's just focus on, you know, maybe it's just like for, for now, like, let's just work on your meals. And then once that becomes good, okay, now let's add in the snacks. Okay, can we up it a little bit more to where you're hitting your body weight goal? So you can take it slow, but know that that's the ultimate goal. Um, let's see here. Next one is to um, use um, whole sources of protein um, that contain um, nine um, of the essential amino acids. So um, you, you wanna make sure that you're getting in things like eggs and chicken and um, tuna and the things that aren't, um, that don't have all like that complete protein source, um, that could be beneficial, but as much as you can try and get it from those, those sources that have all nine, um, amino acids. And then this is an interesting point too. So BCAs, um, if probably everybody has heard of these, it stands for branch chain amino acids. Um, those actually are not beneficial, um, unless you are a vegan, um, Research has actually shown that if you are, if you're getting enough protein in every day, like BCAs won't do a thing for you. It's just a waste of money. Um, if you are not getting enough protein um, because it, they contain, um, that the BCAs contain leucine, which is an isolated amino acid, it actually will mess up the, the kind of the flow of what your body needs to, to build muscle. And it'll actually inhibit that process a little bit. So if you're not getting enough and you're taking BCAs, it's not good. Um, so if you're, if you're vegan, in some cases, if you're vegetarian, it could be beneficial, but for everybody else, save your money. So, uh, okay. Step three is to optimize fiber intake. So, um, this is another, um, really high thermic effect, um, of food, um, category. And so, um, uh, getting enough fiber is going to slow down digestion. It's really, really important for your gut health. Um, and your goal is to shoot for about 20, um, if you're a woman somewhere around 25 to 30 grams a day. And if you're a guy somewhere around like 38 to 40 grams a day, you want to shoot for. So again, that's getting it through fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains, things like that. Um, step number four is you don't want to drop your calories too low. Um, you know, we talked about this and reducing the adaptive, excuse me, thermogenesis process. So if you do your growth hormone and your testosterone, which is needed for um, building muscle, that is going to take a nosedive. Your cortisol is going to skyrocket. Um, and you actually will burn more, you'll burn muscle mass instead of body fat. Um, so bigger cuts, even though you can see progress, like really quickly in the beginning, they actually, they don't really generate better weight loss in the long run. Um, and then step number five. So sleep is so, so, so important. Um, so you want to shoot for about eight hours a night in a cold pitch black room. So any, anywhere from like 62 to 69 degrees is going to be optimal. Um, you want to go to bed and wake up at this, at similar hours every single night, even on the weekends. Um, it's really important for um, generating that circadian rhythm, which is in your gut. So we can delve more into that. Um, uh, lack of sleep actually will impair glucose tolerance and can reduce leptin levels again, which will contribute to adaptive thermogenesis. So this is really interesting. Two nights of bad sleep will increase your appetite by about 25%. And again, that's because of leptin levels. So um, so you, you'll notice that you're probably craving more things, you're, like your willpower is probably um, a bit lower. Um, and then if you get four nights of poor sleep in a row, that's actually going to increase your caloric intake by about 20%. <laughs> Yay. Um, and then this is, this is a kicker here. So if you manage to maintain your caloric deficit, you're actually just going to be burning muscle instead of fat at that point. So that's, you know, sleep is, is so huge. Again, I said this earlier, but 
being a deficit is a stressor to your body and you're adding another huge stressor by not getting enough sleep in, not allowing your body to recover properly. So definitely want to maintain that muscle mass as much as possible. Okay, so I'll quickly go through this. We just have two slides left. Um, then the question is, why are people losing weight? Um, and there's a few different things. Um, being compliant is really what it, it, mostly what it boils down to. And a lot of times people will know that, hey, I'm just, you know, maybe you do really well, like Monday through Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you just like let it rip. And, you know, even though you weren't in a good deficit, you feel like you're working so hard. If over, you know, if you're only doing that for half the week and the other half, you're just blowing it out of the water, that's going to, um, you know, you're, you're just going to stay where you're at. You're, it's going to terminate those, um, those results in progress. Um, non-compliance, um, but maybe people don't know that they're not being compliant. Um, this is really interesting. So um, there was a study that looked specifically at people who claim to be able to, or unable to lose weight. And these people really believed that they were eating less than 1200 calories a day. So the study actually found that they were eating an average of 40%, excuse me, 47% more calories per day than they thought and they claimed. Um, another study looked at how much exercise people thought they were doing versus um, what the reality was. And so participants, um, they, they separated, up, separated them out into two groups. So the first group, um, did 200 calories worth of cardio. And then when they were estimated, um, and when they were asked to estimate how much energy they expended um, and then ate afterward, um, the participants that did the 200 calories, they thought they had burned 825 calories and then ate 556 calories after. The, the group that burned 300 calories thought that they had expended 896 calories and then proceeded to eat 607 calories after on average. And so that right there, like they just ate half their day's worth in one sitting for what they thought that they were eating for the entire day. Right. And, and that, that's a big problem too, with like, um, fitness trackers, like Apple watches. I'll see this with a lot of clients Their their watches will be like, Oh, you burn a thousand calories in that class. And no, like you're probably burning closer to around 300 calories for a class, but we, you know, it just, it way overestimates and that makes us think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm eating, you know, I'm burning 3000 calories a day. And then, you know, you just can't figure out why you're not seeing good results. So, um, so that, that's a big way to, to overestimate things. And then again, after, if you're not tracking properly, like we all think that we do more work and eat better than we actually do. So I've done, I've been tracking for years, I've done it. And, um, and so, um, actually being, you know, very honest with food journals can be really helpful. And, um, and just taking into account, looking at labels, um, you know, just being really aware of, okay, what am I actually putting into my body? Cause we can so easily be like, yeah, I'm in a deficit when really we're not. Um, okay. Next, the, the next thing again. Okay. Yeah. So not, not appropriately tracking progress. Um, so that's why we like to use things like the in body to just have, um, you know, just data, which is very objective data on, are we seeing results or are we not, but actually doing that every single month to make sure that we're staying on track. Um, there's other ways to track progress, you know, progress photos, um, or just, you know, non-scale, non-scale related things, how your clothes are fitting, how you're performing in the gym. There's lots of different ways to measure progress. We want to look at that accurately to see, Hey, are we moving forward? Um, and then counterbalance, another reason is counterbalance and fat loss by weight gain and other tissues. So, you know, if you hop on the scale, you're not using an in body, it might look like, Hey, I'm not losing any weight, but maybe you're building more muscle. And so that's counterbalancing or, um, there's, there's several different reasons that go into that. Um, and then the last option is a true plateau has been hit. So, um, this is the last piece here and I'm just going to hop over here to the plate method. Um, I think you guys can see this. Um, this is a really great way to develop some consistency um, around making sure that you're eating enough um, and, and the right foods. So with the plate method here, you want to shoot for about half of your plate to be non-starchy vegetables. So that's things like your leafy greens, most of your water-based vegetables, uh, excuse me, a quarter, at least a quarter of your plate, you want it to be a lean, lean protein source. So chicken breast, um, you know, um, lean, lean fish, like salmon, tuna, um, ground turkey. I mean, all kinds of things can fit to that category, but, 
about a quarter of your plate. Um, and, and in some cases, like I like to use hands to also measure. So you're looking at like one to two palms um, of protein at each meal and maybe half of that's maybe one palm at each snack. Um, a quarter of your plate, you want it to be a complex carbohydrate. So um, brown rice, quinoa, um, sweet potatoes, things like that. Fruit will fall into that category as well. Um, and then add in a, a healthy plant-based source of fat. So that's things like avocado, olives, um, nuts, things like that. So if you're, if you have a lean source of protein, like chicken breast, you want to add in a plant-based fat. If you have a fattier source of protein, like it's um, ground beef, then you don't need to add fat into your meal, but using that will really, it'll make it simple. And it's a great way to make sure that, Hey, I'm, I'm hitting all the categories. I'm not cutting carbs because that's what everybody's doing these days. You're actually getting enough. Um, helping your leptin levels, um, and also making sure you're, you're feeling full as well, um, with, you know, vegetables and, and, um, protein and things like that. So that is what I have for you today. Um, I will, I know we're running just a little bit over. Um, there's one question here. If you, um, refeed out of a deficit, will you see weight gain temporarily? Um, that's a great question. So, um, yes and no. Um, sometimes you, you will see it because if you're eating more carbs, which is typically what's added in a refeed, um, per one gram of carb that you eat about three to four grams of water, your body's going to store. So sometimes you might see a temporary weight gain, but it's like water weight. Um, or sometimes because you are then eating at me or, um, yeah, at maintenance levels, you're going to be moving a lot more, you know, maybe that's a great time to like go, you know, peer in the gym or hit it hard. Um, you know, in a Metcon or, um, you know, get more walking, you just might have more energy throughout the day. So that could actually um, balance it out a little bit. So that's a great question. Um, okay. Well, um, you guys, if you have any other questions, I'm guessing put those in the chat. I'll stay on for another minute or so. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining. This is all I have for you guys today. And um, I'll go ahead and stop this recording, but thank you again.